Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast with your hosts, Jared Handley and me, Chris Winder. Just two nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is the place, and nerds run the world. Without further ado. All right, so... um Thank you for coming back for part two of this interview. Today, we are going to talk to C.J. Carrilla specifically about his um, novels, full-length novels. Um, so if you are just catching this episode, I suggest that you listen to part one, where he uh, he nerds out about all things role-playing game and all of the all the stuff he's written or played. So, but let's move forward. How did your love of the genre of science fiction translate into writing novels specifically? You've obviously written RPG manuals, but how did you transition from that to full-length novels? Well, um, I started um, as a frustrated novelist doing uh, RPG uh, supplements and eventually uh, became a successful RPG writer that uh, transitioned to uh, fiction. My favorite part with writing um, uh, role-playing game supplements was uh, uh, the little fiction uh, color uh, bits that uh, you put at the beginning of chapters and whatnot. So the, so the world-building source material? Uh, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of books have like you know a, a little fiction uh, blurb at uh, opening chapters or at the beginning of a section, kind of to add some flavor uh, text to the to the whole thing. So. In effect, I ended up writing like hundreds of like flash uh, fiction short stories uh, in my books. Okay. Now, when you write your RPGs, clearly that's tradition published through traditional publishers. Are your novels self-published, or did you go through uh, a publisher? Well, starting out, I um, I submitted to a few people. Uh, I got a no response or your typical boilerplate uh, rejection slips. And uh, I figure, actually, as I was writing, I figure, well, if nobody, um, if I don't get an acceptance within a year of my having the book, I'm going to publish it myself. And that's what I did. Uh, and, and, it, and I didn't do too badly. So now it's become my full-time job. Outstanding. Well, congratulations for being able to make that switch. So what do you think is your single largest influence on, on the novel writing specifically? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one because I have more of a top 10 list. But uh, if I have to uh, say one name, I, I would say Stephen King, uh, just for the uh, dialogue and uh, character development, uh, especially in the first books. Uh, that's probably my biggest creative influence. Okay. He has a, a lot of uh, good things to say on, on the craft of writing and, you know, just the horror stuff in general. So, yeah, I, I could see that, his dialogue. The um, Let's see. For his... For his writing, do you prefer the newer stuff or the older stuff? Oh, older stuff. Yeah, I, I actually haven't read anything after, um, I think, Bag of Bones was the last book I, I read of his. I've heard someone describe it as his new stuff and old stuff might have almost been written by two different authors. They're so different from each other. Yeah, I mean, I think his life experience, uh, perhaps having been in that horrible uh, accident where somebody ran him down, uh, with, uh, I think, a van. Uh, yeah, I think that might have changed him, or maybe just, you know, people change as they get older. But, uh, yeah, his stuff doesn't grab me anywhere near as much as the old stuff. A lot of times when people change when they get older, the older stuff is the more compelling because they've got more life experience. But So it's interesting that you say the uh, – the the or excuse me, the stuff they write when they're older is more compelling. So it's interesting you like the stuff what he wrote when he was younger in Hungary. So, yeah. The – it's weird. But hey, you know, everyone's got their preferences, so don't hate a man for liking what he likes, even if you disagree. Um, and so you've written many series, so I'm going to give a quick list for the listeners so we can all drool over over them. He's written the Warp Marine series, the Beyond Wars series, the New Olympus Saga, and A Bad Vibes, which is a standalone novel. Um, today, we're going to try to focus on his Warp Marine stuff. So if you have an interest in him coming back to talk about his other written novels, in the science fiction genre, send us a, a note. Um, our contact information will be in the show note, and we can certainly invite him back. But uh, for today, we're going to focus on Warp Marine. So how did you come up with the premise for these series? Uh, well, I've always been a fan of uh, military science fiction. 
starting uh, with uh, David Drake, Hammer Slammers. Uh, later on, um, SM Sterling, uh, John Gringo, and David Weber. So uh, I done a lot, quite a bit of reading along those uh, lines. Uh, and uh, the setting, uh, it, it's kind of a weird uh, story. It kind of came out from the original title. Uh, I wanted to call them the Marines something different than Space Marines. Okay. Uh, and so I was batting names around, and I came out, well, how about Warp Marines? And they were, well, what does Warp mean? What? And, and that led to a whole chain of questions. And that uh, That's how I got inspiration for how Warp travel, um, Warp space uh, works, and so on and so forth. And um, that gave me the basic uh, sort of like, uh, structure of the uh, of the setting. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it was it was kind of a, a weird situation there. All right. So the the warp marines um, is clearly a series because there's more than one written. Um, so where do you see that series going? Are there going to be spinoff novels, graphic novel, graphic novels, or are, when you're finished with the series, are you going to write something else? Or are you going to keep it open ended? What's your your plan with the world? Well, um, w- what. Uh, what I did with uh, the War Marine Corps series was a five-book uh, uh, self-contained story. So the fifth book, uh, Havoc of War, is the final book of that particular series. Uh, my plan now is to, um, uh, later this year, release the book one of a new related series called uh, The Bicentennial War. Uh, and... So, so that basically continue the same story, but it will be a, a, a separate series. So it would be a new starting point if people haven't read the other five. Exactly. That's smart. I wonder sometimes. I know the the conventional wisdom is that series sell, but I wonder if you get to a point where the series gets so long that all you're talking to are your existing fans, versus the ability to get new people. Cause I know I've heard people say they don't read the Weber's honor verse because it's just so long. It's intimidating. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that, that was my thought is that, uh, I, I noticed that, well, first of all, just not looking at my own book sales is sort of like, yeah, the, each book sells just a little less than the previous one. Uh, so uh, there is always a drop off. And, uh, I think, yeah, if definitely, if you have like 20 books, uh, a lot of people are going to say, well, I'm never going to get through all of them, so why even start? Uh, I think, I, I, from as my perspective as a reader, because we're, we're talking about all of this, I will remind everyone, we're trying to keep it fan-focused as opposed to just another writing podcast. But as a reader, I like it when they have several shorter series in the same universe. So they're all sort of linked, but you could pick up at any point along the way and sort of have a complete story without having to read, you know, the previous 900 something books. Exactly. Um, yeah, the, the same here. Um, I, I like, I like series. I like to, to be able to revisit the same characters. Uh, but I don't want it to be endless because for one, uh, after, after several books, uh, you start having uh, trouble distinguishing one book from the next. Uh, and of course, some some writers um, end up basically writing the same book over and over again. So that's that's not fun. Uh, you want something new. Every yeah, I, I agree. And and that's one of the things I try to when I do the writing is is what do I like as a reader? And that's I tell myself a story I'd want to hear, and that's about the extent of the thought into. Like I don't try to tell any crazy, you know, larger tale of morality. I just try to have fun. And, and that's what I liked about your books. Oh. I will say, um, and I mentioned this to you as we were doing the the mic testing and stuff, but you're the second author who's ever fooled me about whether they served in the military because your combat was was well done. So, and, well, and you, you fooled uh, the the friend of the show, Logan Scott, who who put me on to your your novels as well. He was convinced that you must have been in the military somewhere. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I always find that uh, incredibly flattering. Um, uh, Obviously, I mean, I have nothing but a tremendous respect for anybody like yourself that actually uh, went there and did that, uh, you know, put on the uniform full uniform, and served the country. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I actually wanted to, in college, uh, join the ROTC program, but my, uh, my university, which was uh, an Ivy League college, uh, didn't have the program. I actually have, we have to travel like an hour to, to even uh, uh, join, the, join the program. So I, I wasn't able to. But I've been very fortunate in having a lot of friends who served, and uh, I, I do try to listen 
when they tell me things and also when they tell me when I'm completely screwing things up. <laughs> so now I know like David Weber created what he calls Bu9, which is basically Uber fans that have various specialties that allow them to sort of keep him factual on the science and stuff. Do you have a, a go-to stable of people who you reference? Uh, well, I'm, I'm growing a, a small group of, um, of beta readers that, uh, that help. Um, I haven't been uh, terribly hard science fiction when it comes to like ship combat and things like that. Uh, but I, I have had people point uh, some major boners I was, uh, I was writing and, uh, and, and I changed them. So hopefully it's not too uh, jarring to people who actually know about that, uh, you know, have a, a technical background. Yeah, I, I, that's the hard part because some of the science, if you get too granular with it, if you get too narrow, like you could quickly find your books dated too. Oh, absolutely. I, I like it when they say that, you know, the ship can do this and they never explain. Like you in Star Trek, you don't understand why a dilithium crystal does anything. You just know they've got dilithium crystals and now they can fly at, you know, warp speed. Yeah, uh, until they can't because the plot demands that they, they can't do it. Right, right. Plot armor is the strongest armor of all. <laughs> yes. So how did you create your, when you were creating the warp drive system for your universe, how did how did you create that? Was there a, um, a real life model you used or did you just sort of figure it out and is, with pure imagination? Was there a science that ex- inspired it? Yeah, it, it, it really is sort of like a, like a Star Wars hyperspace, but um, with with a twist. Basically, uh, to travel faster than light, ships enter a different uh, level of reality through uh, sort of a, a wormhole, and, uh, and 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 the other end of the wormhole happens to be a uh, uh, long distance away. Now, so I, I've seen. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean that. that uh, the, the only the only twist is that obviously the, the wormhole has things and entities inside that um, that can affect the people people as they as they travel through uh, through it. I, I did like that twist. Now, when you write, um, is there any? Now, I've only read the first one. I'm getting ready to start the second one, so so don't spoilers. But do you have any plans to involve alternative dimensions as a potential side effect of uh, the traveling through the wormholes? Well, there is some of that. Uh, I do explore uh, the uh, the elements of, of warp space uh, in, in in the books, in the in the first five books, and there will be more stuff in the follow up series. Okay, I I, um, I find that whole thing fascinating. I know Terry Mixon did it with his uh, Empire of Bones series, where he's just now starting to explore it more. Which I think it's just a fascinating because then you're going to have the same character, but like an evil version, if you would, if you wanted. Uh- Oh yeah, it, it just gives you it gives you so much room for imagination. Yep, that's uh, always good. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're telling these stories, um, since you started your professional writing, writing RPGs, do you find that the way you tell a story for an RPG overlaps into how you tell your novels? Uh, to some degree, um, a big thing uh, on on game design is world building. You know, creating the setting and. Uh, Making some rules for the setting, and I always uh, that helped me a lot uh, when I'm designing uh, science fiction novels. Uh, obviously, you want to think about all the um, you know even basic economics, uh, how society works, how the politics work. So definitely, that's a big help. Uh, it's been a big help when I when I came to designing the uh, the fictional universe. Okay, now do you? Um, I've seen some people, and we'll come back to the David Weber because you know he's got such an expansive universe at this point. After what almost twenty years of, of publishing that that universe, uh, he actually they ended up publishing like sort of almost like what I would call a universe bible, where it talks about the ships and the science and the worlds. And is that something you think you might do for your your warp marine universe? Yeah, I wouldn't mind trying to come up with like a, a little wiki uh, warp marine webpage at some point i know the danger with that at least i would imagine as a fan if if you're not careful you could get spoilers in the in the the write-up or, or you you lock yourself in on canon that you know you might want to change down the road if you publish that hasn't been stuff that hasn't been talked about yet oh that, well that that is true it is tricky um I even had to be careful when i was um writing the glossary at the end of the books uh 
because sometimes uh, some of the descriptions might uh, give away information that wasn't apparent in the earlier books. I can see that. Yeah, that, that would always be a danger because it's, it's easy sometimes for some of those descriptions just to cut and paste from book to book because some of that's not going to change. Yes. So do you, uh, do you have some sort of um, super fan that goes behind you with a beta reading process to make sure you don't do that? Uh, so far, none of my volunteers have, have been that, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, dedicated to, uh, to examine the books. <laughs> yeah. I, I, but I'm I, sure I, I'll run into somebody. Well, as you keep writing more, I'm sure, sure those fans will come out of the woodwork. Oh, yeah. Um, what makes your what do you think makes your Space Marines unique from those in other uh, science fiction series? Well, in, in some ways, I, I was a little inspired by um, by Warhammer Forty Thousand and and the idea of uh, and, and even the whole concept of war. But uh, something that uh, that occurred to me was uh, uh, bringing back uh, the idea of boarding parties in space combat. Uh, it's the old joke about why doesn't the Star Trek just like send like a bazillion people or a nuke via their transporters into the enemy ships? I've always wondered that. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So I kind of played around with that idea on on, on the warband uh, side. Okay. The other part is is some people would argue that well, the science you're not going to have close quarters combat with space or close quarters combat in general. You're going to do everything at a distance, but. Even if the science says they might be right, that gets boring. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I mean, if, if if your space battles are like, okay, everybody, you know, you're shooting a little blips on your sensor screen, and then when you destroy the enemy ships, it's over because you just get on the orbitals and you can destroy anything that's moving on the surface, and that's it. So I try to come up with ideas on why you could still need to send people, you know, have boots on the ground and, uh, and get in there and uh, fight people. So, obviously, if anybody knows the real military, the higher up in rank you go, the more removed you get from combat. So, how do you tell your your story of that universe with the main characters people have grown to love, but still keep it authentic to the idea that, you know, if he's a colonel, how, how much action is he really going to see? Yeah, well, I've been um, lucky that well, the, the main character during the initial uh, five-book series... Uh, uh, he, he starts out as a captain and uh, ends up as a captain. He doesn't really go up in rank uh, very much in that conflict. Uh, one element in, in the in the series is that uh, uh, there is a lot of anti-aging technology available. So that means that picking up rank just takes a lot of uh, time and effort. Uh, by the same token, you are not. Uh, it's not a matter of pick up or get out. Where if you don't go up in rank, they they throw you out. So you have people who have been like, you know, staff sergeants for uh, 50 years and are happy being staff sergeants and are damn good staff sergeants, and that's not going to change. Okay. Now, how did you come up with your idea for the anti-aging tech? Are you, do you ever explain it in detail, or you just say that it's there and, and move on? Yeah, you say it's, it's a technology that, that's fairly mature when, when the, uh, the spacefaring civilizations uh, share it with humans, and they just use it. So there's no um, no big like techno bubble uh, uh, blur bubble. I always wonder some of that. Like that's one of the things they don't really explain too much in the the Weberverse, for instance, where they have the uh, the prolonged treatment. The uh, is how it happens. I've, I've I'm always fascinated because I'm the kind of nerd that wants to know those things. So I like it when they give the techno babble. As long as you don't you know go into the textbook boring range, like there's that happy medium. Yeah, yeah. So. The um, I just I find all of that fascinating. Is it something that you you've put a lot of thought into and just haven't shared, or is it something that you know it just it's there and you moved on? Well, I mean, th- there is so many um, promising uh, technologies in real life now that, that uh, offer the possibility that we could be uh, aging uh, all together. That um, I just figured that uh, I mean, if, if I if I said anything too detailed. It might become dated in as little as a few years from now, uh, uh, but I did keep thought about about the consequences of uh, having people who don't grow older. Uh, one thing that happened was uh, it, it does become progressively more expensive the longer you stay alive. So and and 
and in in the setting it's not a right you don't have a right to eternal life so if you don't produce enough income to keep yourself uh, updated you will eventually grow old and die okay yeah and one of the first things that disappear um, from the setting is uh, pensions uh, you you get a pension but it's not for life once you re- you can retire and you get uh, a pension for about half the time you put in in your job or occupation and um, at the end of that time, uh, that, that gets cut off and you have to uh, get a new job. Okay. So there's benefit to w- just working longer so you can keep paying for the treatment. Yes. Okay. Now, is that something you plan on exploring uh, in, in deeper into the plot line in your future spinoff series? or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, next, the next book in the series happens uh, a few decades after the last book of the, of the original series. And you see people dealing with retirement. Uh, one of the marine's character, marine characters, uh, discovers that retirement isn't um, in, in all that it was cracked up to be. Yeah, and that, that happens with yeah. a lot of act of regular military. They they hate it while they're in, and they get out, and they man, I wish I could go back. <laughs> yeah, and in this setting that happens a lot. People that take some time off and they uh, they go back because uh, they're still young. I mean, they're still well, physically young. Right. So uh, in your universe, we've talked about what makes the um, your Space Marines unique from from the others. But if you're if you're if you were analyzing it from um, let me say this from like an AAR an after action report perspective, and they were analyzing themselves, what do you think your Space Marines would say was their biggest flaw? Are they overeager, too timid? Uh, what would their their weakness in this universe be? I think over eager uh, is a good word to describe them. Uh, they they do retain the the, the whole uh, idea of uh, you know travel to strange worlds, meet exotic aliens, and kill them. <laughs> yeah, so. uh, and the setting is shaped by by first contact, where where aliens essentially wipe out half of humanity or more. Uh, so there is always a tendency that uh, if something threatens you, the best way to deal with it is to uh, deliver enormous amounts of uh, ordnance upon their heads until they go away. I absolutely like that. I um, <laughs> I remember one of my platoon sergeants once telling me that uh, as soldiers in the infantry, we spoke the international language of love, 5.56 calibers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I could see that um, portraying in the um in your universe now what do you plan on doing as far as the weapons in your universe did how did you decide what you were going to do because you know you could do energy bolts plasma chain guns you know still chemical reaction you know slug throwers how did you design the weapons you used well i went for um I try to combine the, the traditional tropes you know you have your lasers and your beam weapons and whatnot um and then applied it to uh, humanity or actually a United States uh, that survived this, this situation that doesn't have uh, as quite as much uh, money or, or the, you know, industrial output as the older galactic species. So they combine things like uh, they still have like regular slug throwing weapons, but they've improved the ammo. So the ammo, of each, each bullet uh, strikes like a little mini RPG. Uh, and by that, I don't mean a uh, role playing game, but <laughs> rocket propel grenade. Yeah, I, I like the way you did it. I was just curious how you came up with, with the idea in the mix that you did. Now, some authors prefer when they write their, their military, it's just a, one soldier is sort of a jack of all trades, and others mirror the, the squad level specialization that we see with like the RPG rocket propelled grenade, or the grenadiers, the, uh, the marksmen, the small automatic weapon, squad automatic weapon, whatever the word they use. How did you decide which approach you were going to take? Well, I definitely went for the, um, for, for the current approach. Uh, you, uh, I designed the, everything uh, down to the fire team level and then all the way up to battalion level. So I have all the different uh, brands and, and types of platoon, 
platoon is actually the first novel. I'm sure you noticed it was a weapon platoon, not a standard infantry platoon. I did notice. That's why I asked. I just – yeah, yeah. I, I try to word the questions for people who might not have, have read the book. But the um, that's one of the things I did like was that specialization. I mean, there, there are sometimes reasons to do it if the plot makes sense. If you've got, I don't know, evil alien overlords that don't want you to be too good at anything, okay, it makes sense. But, you know, it, just as a general rule, I think some people just assume that one weapon is as good as the other. I think you captured this, that spirit very well. The idea that, you know, every soldier's weapon is different. What's that? Um, have you seen the movie Full Metal Jacket? Oh yeah, yeah, that that boot camp scene. This is my rifle. There are many others like it, but this one is mine. That that sort of mentality you captured well, I think. Oh, thank you. So the um, I, I definitely like that um, that approach. It definitely it gives you flexibility as far as what you can do to get creative to keep the story moving too. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, but but definitely I, I went through the the entire TOC of um, of. Uh, uh, marine um, expeditionary unit, and then I tried to uh, to update it to the technology that the aliens have, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, that that gives it a nice uh, balance because you you can use it to address a lot of different situations. Uh, and actually, the, the second book uh, uh, has a lot more uh, uh, ground combat, so between actual uh, equivalent technology technological uh, forces. And that definitely helps. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a second real quick to pause for a word from our sponsor. They picked a fight with the wrong species. A nation at war. The United Stars of America. Born in the conflagration of an unprovoked alien attack. The newest entrant to galactic politics took the few crumbs of hypertech gifted to it and ran with them soon expanding over dozens of star systems and establishing a wide trade network protected by its powerful navy and the dreaded warp marines in a fight to the death a single marine platoon tasked with protecting an embassy on a hostile alien planet an embassy and the fragile human enclave around it that soon finds itself surrounded by armed mobs. Can the Marines and a ragtag band of civilian and Navy personnel survive long enough to be rescued? All right. So thank you to our wonderful, wonderful sponsors. Um, So you had mentioned that um, when you created the tactics, you tried to uh, envision what might be based on what was. And I love that approach. It's the, it's the same one I use. I do it because I'm lazy and it's what I know. It's what I was taught in the army infantry school. So it just makes sense for me. So what made you as someone who doesn't have that experience decide to do it that way? Cause it's definitely not what everyone does. Yeah. Well, to me, it just feels, um, I, I guess more real. Um, like for instance, um, in, in the first novel, uh, I have an entire sequence where there's combat inside a city and, and I modeled parts of it on um, on Black Hawk Down, uh, you know, the Battle of Somalia, and then on, on accounts uh, from um, from uh, the Gulf Wars, uh, as they were uh, what they were fighting with heavy vehicles in uh, in an urban setting. That makes sense. Uh, the uh, yeah, this this actually yeah, uh, and there was actually one 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 scene that I stole this straight from uh, from a book about a marine captain where. Uh, where a heavy uh, gunner actually like takes a building, uh, cuts a building in half with his automatic weapon. Um, in real life, I think it was like a fifty caliber or the grenade launcher. But uh, okay, I know. But yeah. I've seen what um, in some parts of the world, especially third world countries where the U.S. at least is engaged, uh, a lot of the buildings are made out of of basically clay bricks, if you would. So a fifty caliber yes. chews right through that. Um, right. And, you know, obviously each building that you build is going to be based on what is uh, conducive to the temperature around it. Um, And so, you know, obviously that factors in on how how destructive their ability to withstand that destruction is, I guess. So but when you wrote your um, your series using the existing existing tactics. So did you when we when we fight 
now, we obviously we're on a plane because you know the ground is the ground. When you start talking about space combat, you have to start thinking in a sphere because what's below you and what's above you matters just as much. So, did right. you sit down and like write your own tactical manual um, to consider all that, or is that just something you make up as you go? Um, no, I did try to have um, uh, some some basic rules uh, set in place before I started writing. That way, I I, I didn't have to stop and ask questions that uh, uh, might eventually uh, eventually contradict later stuff. Um, so in a space combat, for example, uh, ships arrange themselves in a, in a battle wall rather than a battle line because they want to uh, to basically project on, on three dimensions at once. And uh, ground combat um, uh, is it tends to be uh, on a level field simply because there are so many beam weapons that uh, aerial vehicles don't get a lot of survivability. Okay. So you do want to stay close to the ground. That makes sense. Now, when you we mentioned with the RPGs the idea of that tabletop for visualization, when you do the combat scenes for for your novel specifically, is that something you war game out in the with the tabletop type approach, or do you still keep it all in your head? Uh, a, a bit of both. I have um, when I did some big set piece battles, I did have to uh, to set to sketch down a little map in my. Uh, on paper, uh, just to make sure I, could, I was visualizing all the terrain features and um, and get a feel for what, what was possible and what wasn't. Okay. Yeah, I, I do that too. I find it helps because, you know, what you know of the battle, unless you've got like a HUD interface, um, heads-up display type deal, and your body armor showing you what everyone else sees, you're still limited by what you can observe in your line of sight. So knowing what's in your way definitely can affect what each character's experience would be. Oh, yeah, definitely. So do you um, have any plans in your, your next series as it evolves to um, have the technology improve, or are you going to keep the, the technology stable between the, the series and the universe? Well, um, no spoilers, but uh, yeah, later books uh, do provide certain technological leaps um, that will impact um, the next series very much. Okay. So speaking... Um, as a fan of, of the all of the sci-fi tropes, when you design your aliens, is there anything you use? Do you just you know have fun and get creative, or do you try to keep it to as we understand you know biology, or do you just you know go to town with a bestiary? Well, um, I, I I do want to make them uh, uh, feel uh, alien uh, as much as I can, and uh, but uh, yeah, I generally try to um, to. Uh, take uh, elements from certain cultures that uh, in history and whatnot and exaggerate them a bit or, or take them to their logical or illogical conclusion. Uh, and biologically, uh, what I have, the way I have it set up, most of the aliens that interact with humans tend to uh, live in similar uh, environments as humans. So biologically, they're not terribly different. Although that doesn't say much. I mean, there's one alien that looks more like a... a like a lamprey than uh, than anything else uh, that, that walks on, on, on air surface, uh, so they can be pretty alien and disgusting, but uh, they are still like mostly uh, biologically similar. Okay, so where do you get your inspiration when you pick what the alien's going to look like? Probably, well, I mean, uh, at its basic uh, level, uh, what role they are going to play in the in the story. Uh, and in some cases, just try to come up with something uh, a little different or interesting. Okay. It, uh, it, when you describe them, some authors prefer to use existing animals, so they would say, "Oh, the character is cat-like," or he's, you know, fill in the blank. Is that something you try to avoid, or that you jump right in with both feet? Well, I try not to make them too much like, like uh, you know, uh, an exact analog. But what I do is that. The, the humans in the story do tend to like assign aliens a quick label, uh, usually with an animal name, just because that's how people are. You know, they want to reduce everything to uh, to a simple, uh, you know, to a single word if they can. But uh, there's just, there is always like more complexity than what the stereotypes would, would suggest. I think it's also a, a balancing act. You know, as as somebody you know from the reader's perspective, you want to be able to visualize it. So those analogs help you in your head. 
but you still want it to be alien. But how do you do that if it's if it's so alien? We, you know what I mean? Like uh, balancing something they can understand and visualize versus you know the unknown non-human, essentially. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, I mean, you can think uh, real aliens might be something that we can't even uh, uh, perceive exactly what they are, let alone understand them or even communicate with them. Uh, but that makes for a for a pretty weird story. Yeah, that's one of the things that fascinated me by aliens. I first got interested in that when I was in college, and I took a class. And we're not going to go there, so but I took a class on religion, um, the Bible as literature, and we studied basically all of the the cultural relig- and religions of the world. It was it was sort of that level of sociology class. And in the process of doing my research paper for that class, that came across an article where the College of Cardinals, which if, you, if you're not Catholic, that's basically like the governing body, for, for lack of a better description, for the Catholic Church, were having a, a group that met to help, de- you know, if, if we found life on other planets, uh, how do we determine what's a, a sentient creature and thus one of God's creatures versus um, a space cow and we can eat it kind of thing? And I just, that whole concept fascinated me. And, you know, I was already a, a Star Wars fan, and it just sort of set my mind all kinds of crazy places. So, that is great. I, I don't know if that's even true. I, I remember reading the article, but, you know, obviously not everything that's on the internet is true. I know spoilers, people, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people like to just troll you. So, but just that whole idea, you know, as we start talking about, alien species and, and where you draw the line. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky situation. I mean, and, and it's been explored in, in a lot of uh, science fiction, of, of course. But, uh, but yeah, there's always new twists to the whole idea of what, what is intelligence, what is sentience. So that actually plays into when we're talking about sentience and intelligence, artificial intelligence. So how do you view that role in your, in your universe? Well, the, the, a point of view there um, uh, is that it, that artificial intelligence turns out to be a lot harder to create than uh, we expected at our current technological level. Uh, and, and in this setting, actually, what happens is when they create an actual artificial intelligence, it sort of takes a look at the um, at the universe and what they see as the meaningless of the universe. Because uh, they, they look at it from a purely materialistic point of view, and then they kill themselves. But there is no point in being alive. So there is not there aren't a lot of artificial intelligence that's running around. Is that something you plan on explain, expanding with you know alien encounters later, or is that something you don't you know plan to address further? Well, there is the whole idea that uh, without the spiritual component, uh, life is meaningless, and artificial intelligence need to get that before they can actually survive. So th- that might get explored in future novels or stories. That's definitely a fascinating concept. I- I'm definitely curious to see see what you do with that. So the um, when it comes to aliens, one of the the standard tropes is the first contact experience. So what is your your origin story. How'd you come up with the idea of this is when humans first met um, aliens? Well, I wanted it to be um, a, a traumatic event. <laughs> uh, obviously, I think any sort of first contact is going to be a massive uh, a shock to the system. In this case, um, the first, first contact occurs between two um, uh, warring starships that uh, happen to, to drift into uh, into the solar system, and, and the results are, are, are terrible for humanity. Yeah. So that that sets the the stage for for how uh, humans view the rest of the universe. It, it started with uh, bombs falling out of the sky and obliterating entire cities. Well, Stephen Hawking would approve of that approach. <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah. he has a very grim view of how it's going to go for humanity when we first meet aliens. Yes, he definitely is not a fan. Now, did that inspire you at all, or was it purely, you know, this is what I need for the plot, and I, I went with it? Yeah, it's um, well, it def- it's definitely um, in mind. I mean, obviously, uh, well, I'm a big uh, reader of history, and usually when a more advanced civilization encounters a, a more primitive one, uh, it's never good for the primitives. No. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's always been firmly in my mind. Uh, 
in this case, I sort of like fudge the dice a little bit in humanity's favor so they don't get crushed like bugs from the get go, but it's still an uphill battle to survive. Okay. Now, is there something, because the technology was sufficiently advanced that they had this anti-aging stuff, did, um, was there any play on the uh, disease exposure, which also happens sometimes when you have two, uh, histor- two societies that are at div- different levels of advancement interacting for the first time? Uh, well, what I have is uh, medical technology was advanced enough that, uh, that bio-warfare, even an unintentional bio-warfare is not... Uh, is not really uh, feasible. So diseases didn't play a huge role. Now, is there any plan in the future to go back and tell those first contact stories in more detail? Um, I, I sometimes thought about it, but, but I mean, it's um, the first contact period is, is really pretty depressing. I mean, you, you essentially have uh, people dying and then a breakdown of society uh, that uh, only the United States, by sheer luck, uh, manages to avoid completely. Although they still get hammered uh, very hard. Okay, so uh, some people like the uh, the Debbie Downer story, so there might still be a market for it. But, that is true. <laughs> uh, if nothing else, you could do it as a as a standalone kind of thing. So it's definitely definitely interesting. I'm always curious to see you know how the author envisions all of that happening. So I've always thought that if we were going to have colonies on other planets, that it would probably start as some sort of reality TV show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, or, or definitely as a vanity project for some internet uh, billionaires, which is what seems to be happening nowadays. Yeah. But ooh, he's doing uh, Elon Musk is doing amazing things for science right now. Oh yeah. 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 I, it's like, I, I'm torn between thinking he's like a, like a high end type, uh, super hero or a, uh, James Bond super villain. Ooh, well, that could be some interesting stories. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, sometimes I get like paranoid thoughts that one day he's going to unveil this like fleet of uh, killer satellites and say, well, uh, the rest of the solar system belongs to me and my army of cloned uh, super models. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could definitely, uh, give you ideas for another universe after the warp marines <laughs> yeah elon musk as super villain i've yeah. always in my head because you know I, i'm probably a little paranoid but i keep thinking you know we we know what he said was in the trunk but how do we know what was really in the trunk and for, right. for all we know he's hiding bodies in there and sending them into orbit to destroy oh, yeah. the evidence <laughs> definitely the perfect murder <laughs> so i don't know what he's talking about there's no body and don't look in the tesla's yeah. trunk it's in space Hey, do we know if there was a dummy inside that spacesuit or not? Ooh, I hadn't even thought of that. I went with the trunk because that's what you do on... I like the way you think, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the... Um, do you ever plan on telling any of these stories in the in the Warp Marine universe specifically from potentially the alien point of view? Yeah, I mean, I do, um, I do that a, a bit in the subsequent books. And um, I, I do want to write a spin-off uh, series that's going to be more like Firefly and less uh, military-oriented. And that's going to have uh, more alien characters, uh, and that should give us a, a better look at their culture and the way they think. Okay. Now, how do you determine what um, what alien species you use? Have you already decided, or do you just pick the ones that were more popular? Yeah, that's still in, in sort of the drafting um Stage, but uh, definitely going to use the uh, the the so-called puppies, where the uh, the the friendly aliens uh, who sort of adopt humanity as as their uh, brothers, I suppose, in the in the coming conflicts. Okay, so does that mean that you're a, a dog person in real life, or just sort of worked out that way that they were the puppies? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I mostly own cats, but uh, I think I, I'm more of a dog person because even my cats start behaving like dogs after a while. <laughs> I ask because um, we've got an episode that we just recorded that, that goes out on the 26th with um, Casey Azell and Marissa Wolf, where they wrote the uh, Depic Assassins in the Four Horsemen universe, which are basically cat assassins. <laughs> okay. And, and now you're talking about the uh, the puppies. So I just, it just it's humorous. I don't know. Oh, yeah. That's one of those things where you can start an argument where everybody can leave and not hate each other is when you talk about like cats and dogs or pineapples on pizza and the sinful nature of oh. it. <laughs> Absolutely. So do you put pineapples on your pizza? Uh, no. All right. I like you even more today. <laughs> so, all right. Well, the 
that's the the warp marine. So can you give us, since it's in the same universe, what your thoughts are as much as you can without spoilers uh, on the series that follows? Uh, well, like I said, it's going to be set uh, sometime after the last conflict, and it opens a um, essentially the reborn United Stars of America is um, uh, changing its role in uh, in galactic politics. Uh, and then uh, a new crisis appears. But I can't give too many details without spoiling uh, uh, the previous series. So I am going to have to be uh, mysterious. Well, we appreciate that because sometimes this is how people first discover new books, is, is hopefully through our podcast or others. So you definitely want to uh, keep that in mind as, as we try to keep everything spoiler-free for people. But um, so I appreciate you you're answering it in such a way. So this is the the point in the interview where we we take a break from talking about your books. Uh, shameless plugging is over, and we start talking about the uh, the novels that you are reading in the in the sci fi universe. So is there there anything out there that you're currently enjoying? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I just finished um, an advanced copy of uh, John De La Ross, uh, The Stars Entwined, which was a lot of fun. Um, What's the name of that I'm one? A sort of uh, the Stars Entwined by John De La Ross. Currently, I'm reading some old stuff. Um, I'm reading uh, Philip Jose Farmer's uh, River World books. Okay. I haven't read those. Um, when does the uh, the Intertwined go out? Is that something that's going to be soon? Oh, yeah. That's that's coming out, um, I think, uh, this month or in March, I think. Okay. I'll have to get with John because I'm friends with him on Facebook and see if I can get a uh, a link if he's got one so we can we can mention that in the show notes oh. we uh we try to when authors talk about you know all the books and this what people are reading to give people links so they can check it out themselves absolutely yeah i'm, I'm also about to start uh, the hidden truth by hans j hans hans g Shantz. that's an old book i have in my reading list okay so you mentioned in the in the pre-show that you were also reading i think the galaxy's edge books was another thing? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I think of book three or four, and I have the other books on my on my Kindle list, basically. Yeah, I just finished the fourth one myself and about to start the fifth. So those I've enjoyed those that those takes on the Star Wars because they got some of what I didn't like about the newer stuff better told. So oh, absolutely. I I don't know if you've read the uh, Republic Commando series. The um, Karen Travis, I think, is the one that wrote them. But we're, um, and she wrote some about the Mandalorian. So she had that sort of stormtrooper, merc focused books in, that she wrote for the for the universe, and they got dropped from the canon. And it's just like, oh no, that's what made the Star Trooper or the Stormtroopers no. good again. Yeah, yeah, a lot of good stuff get, ended up uh, being uh, erased. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but we we don't have all day to talk about what went wrong with Star Wars. So <laughs> that'd be its own. Uh, that you could make a whole series of shows. Yes, like that. we could, and probably never run out of stuff to talk about. But we try to keep everything positive because there's enough negativity out there. So so we'll, we'll just move on. What did you think of the uh, the stars intertwined by uh, Della Rose? Was that something that you really enjoyed? Yeah, that was a, that was a very fun book. It, it, it reminded me of like. Um, uh, Classic Trek, but done better. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting book, and it has a nice. Uh, it combines uh, the military with espionage, so uh, I, I found it very entertaining. Okay, I'll have to check that out when it comes out. Um, and what about the Reaver books? What what was it about those that that you like so much? Well, they're, they're an interesting uh, setting. Uh, Philip Jose Farmer wrote in the seventies and eighties. Um, and uh, this book has, um, well, this series is actually several books, uh, has everybody who ever died being reborn along this, this huge uh, millions of mile long uh, river. And they have to deal with that, uh, that sort of afterlife. Okay. I'll have to check that out. That wasn't one I was familiar with. So with, the, um, uh, with, your, with your stuff, is that influenced, do you think, by some of what you're reading? Uh, yeah, there's always stuff. Uh, I I sometimes try to be careful because cause you unconsciously end, could end up stealing things from other people. But uh, but yeah, there's always a lot of influence. I definitely have to uh, credit uh, David Drake with uh, with a lot of uh, ideas and especially the tone of combat that uh, I've uh, 
I've been influenced by by, it, by his work. Uh, Hammer Slammers is definitely one. I, I bought the series. I just haven't had time to read it. Um, I couldn't figure out why my reading was slowing down. And then I went to, um, to get my glasses fixed and they're like, yeah, your prescription isn't current. I'm like, Oh, well that would do it. <laughs> oh yeah. So, yeah. So what to do I've got to go do that. And, and that's sometimes irking, uh, irks someone, some of the books I like so much that, you know, if I'm driving around, I could listen to the audiobooks, but they're just not out in audiobook yet. So it right. does some, sometimes slow you down if you're spending a lot of time on the go. Now, um, are your books out in audio? Is that something you plan on doing? I have the first books of the World Marine series out in audio, and I'm waiting for the fifth. Uh, and I actually need to start nagging the producing uh, company to uh, to let me know when when that one is coming out because I get a lot of uh, emails. From people. Yeah, that's one of the things that um, when I saw you know you had those five books, I'm like, man, I I need to get these on audiobooks. <laughs> so we uh, we recently started that uh, Audible subscription thing, so we get the credits every month. So I, oh, yeah, I started yeah. uh, adding a bunch of books to my library. So when I'm taking trips and stuff, is that something you prefer uh, to still read traditionally? Are you a Kindle guy, a paperback book or, or audio book or all of the above? Uh, I'm pretty big on the Kindle because the last time I moved, I had over a hundred boxes of books and that's just too much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had that problem I, when I moved too. <laughs> Yeah, so I like the idea of having a uh, thousand books or more in my in my little uh, portable device. But I definitely like to write uh, to to uh, to read uh, the words on on a screen uh, over listening. I, I think because I can read faster than I can listen to it, and also when I listen to things, I sort of lose track. I could see that. That was my problem in the beginning, but I sort of made myself learn to because I spend so much time on the go, taking my wife to her doctor's appointments and whatnot. That it was like it was that or nothing. And, and, and with uh, some of the books I was reading, I was like, I have to know what happens. <laughs> Your, yours is one of the ones that did that, by the way. It kept me up a few nights. Well, thank you. <laughs> so that's when I was. That's why I was selfishly asking about audiobooks because I haven't checked for those yet to see if that was an option. But yeah, definitely. Books one through four are already out, and book five should be out this year. Outstanding. I will have to uh, check that out. And uh, now you, uh, we're going to get your contact information in a minute. But is um, is that something you send out? Do you have like a mailing list where if, if someone wanted to follow when new things come out, like the audiobooks, could do you, does your mailing list do that for them? Yes, I, I do. Uh, I normally uh, put out new releases on, on my mailing list, and the the way to join it is right on my uh, on my web page. Outstanding. So I might have to do that myself as soon as we finish this interview. So the other part that we do as we um, wrap an episode up is we talk about if there are any scientific breakthroughs that are you're following or excited by, because obviously the science influences the science fiction. So is there anything you're watching? Well, uh, definitely, I've been following SpaceX uh, very closely. Uh, they, I mean, they, they really done more for the space exploration in a few years than NASA has in like the last three decades. Absolutely, and that's very impressive. So, I, I've actually been watching when, since you mentioned the SpaceX, the um, the SpaceX with Elon Musk and Virgin Galactic, and some of these other uh, Blue Orbital. I think it is is the other one. But there's a couple, a couple yeah. of these companies that are starting to get competitive with each other, and I could see that pushing it even farther. Oh yeah, I mean it's like uh, I've never been so hopeful about the future of uh, space exploration as I have been in, in these last few years. So I'm just waiting for the uh, the Trumps and the um, uh, the Hiltons to have hotels on uh, on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Although yeah. until my book some more, I'll probably be staying at the Motel Six. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've actually been watching um, a house-sized asteroid recently made a close pass through Earth, which isn't really that uncommon. Uh, I think we're hearing about them more because our ability of tracking them is getting better. So I'm definitely interested in seeing how our ability to track all of that is uh, is growing because I think that has implications for for all of the writing. I mean, like how you design your planetary defense system, for instance. It's definitely an interesting time to be alive. Oh, yeah. I mean, I thought after, after that big Russian uh, near miss uh, happened that there would be more, more effort put into, uh, into detection and interception. But um, I don't know. So that's a worry. They're going to wait until there's a major impact before they actually start doing something. Yeah, I've noticed that too. The other concern is that um, 
they're talking about with SpaceX and the Tesla, they're worried about it being becoming space trash and crashing back to to the Earth. Now, I'm not convinced that the uh, the stuff that the Teslas are made of is going to withstand reentry. I, I think it'll burn up in the atmosphere, but it still hasn't motivated anyone to start thinking about how we clean up the uh, all the trash floating around in near Earth orbit because you know failed satellites that died or whatever. Oh yeah, that's a big thing. Although I'm hearing that now that they have the BFR rocket that they're they're getting bigger and bigger payloads, they could put out a fleet of uh, of like uh, cleaning satellites dedicated to like picking up the trash. Well, that actually would be that'd be an interesting development because that's one of the things. Recently, there was an article, and I haven't heard what happened with it, but the Chinese space station was supposed to crash into the planet, and they didn't really know where. They just had like a longitudinal grid coordinate that basically covered most continents um, because, you know, they're not going to get much warning either. So I've, I've always wondered how they're going to handle that. Yeah, that's definitely something that hopefully somebody's thinking about it. And if not somebody officially, at least some science fiction author that can uh, can inspire or we can tag Elon Musk. Say, hey, Elon, <laughs> do something about Yeah, it. I keep hoping that if, uh, if I keep bugging him on Twitter that maybe he'll agree to come and be a guest for the uh, – uh, we, we don't want to just interview authors, although that's certainly fun. We, we try to see if we can get fans for various um, sci-fi clubs um, and get actual scientists on to talk about it. So I keep uh, – keep- Oh, Keep hoping cool. we can get someone. Unfortunately, until you have a, a little bit of a body of work out there, people aren't willing to to take a chance. So it's kind of hard to approach them until you have a couple episodes under your belt. Oh, yeah. But we're finally there. The other one we'd love to see, are you familiar with Michu Kaku? Um, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. He's the physicist that does all of the thinking on, on what the future would hold as far as science and all that. Uh, yeah, I think I've, I've heard yeah, I, I, I've been reading one of his books um, about the future of physics that um, I'm just fascinated to see to see what he thinks. So I'd be that'd be another good interview. But I'll list his uh, his information listeners in the show notes um, just so you can check him out yourself. And I'm if I'm mispronouncing it, I'm so sorry. But um, but we've we've been at this uh, part two episode for for just about an hour, and I've asked all of my questions. So this is the part of the interview where I ask you, uh, CJ, where they can find you, and um, or at least the one you're the most active on, because we'll list all of them in the show notes. Well, the the ones uh, to really uh, go to are uh, my website uh, www.cjcarella.com. And my Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash CJ Carrera. Outstanding. And he's very um, responsive on his Facebook page, people. So if you want to nerd out over his books and, and his author page is, is active too. He answers questions and comments and stuff there. That's that's how I got in contact with him. So it's definitely worth doing. And if you want to know where you can find us, we are at, for our website, www.sfshenanigans, Sierra Fox Tot, Foxtrot shenanigans.com. Our Twitter is Sierra Fox Sierra SFS underscore show. And our email is podcast at SF shenanigans.com. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us for Chris Winder. I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the sci-fi shenanigans podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. Boom.